Welcome to Journaling with Nature, the podcast for those who want to turn curiosity into wonder, a pencil sketch into a rabbit hole of discovery, a moment of stillness into a life full of joy. I'm your host, Bethan Burton. Let's open the pages of our nature journals and explore this world together. Hello, this is episode 106. I hope you're well and enjoying this time of seasonal transition wherever you are in the world. I'm looking forward to sharing today's conversation with you. Sarah Reed is a naturalist and nature journaler who I connected with because we have a shared love of nature, of course, but also a very strong shared passion for horses, which has been a huge theme in Sarah's life and family history. In our chat today, we talk all about contributing to citizen science, what it is to be a naturalist, making art and nature more accessible, and of course, lots and lots of horsey stuff. Let's listen. Sarah, thank you so much for joining me today on the podcast. Hi, thank you for having me. I'm excited about this. I'm excited to get to know you. We have known each other a little online just through our posts and there and interactions and I am looking forward to getting to know your story through through this conversation. Great. So tell me, I always start back at the beginning and I wonder if you could tell me some stories about your childhood. Did you have nature around you when you were young? Um, yes, I um, started going outdoors with my parents um, when I was just an infant. We started camping when I was six months old. And um, my dad carried me down to the bottom of the Grand Canyon in a backpack, a child backpack, <laughs> when I was a toddler. So I kind of joke that that was my first real intense study of trail building and trail um, design, <laughs> because I was able to study it from my dad's back. Um, and so we, we grew up camping, um, partly because my dad was a school teacher. So we were off all summer and we would camp in national forests and we went fishing. We um, went to national parks like for a trip about every couple of years as like a big trip. And through Girl Scouts also um, our focus so from the time I was about eight years old and I stayed in Girl Scouts through high school and actually still a lifetime member, the focus has always been outdoors. Mm -hmm. So um, when I did my, my big project as a senior in high school, my project was centered around a local regional park and the lake and the habitat around the lake and how man affects the environment to teach it to younger Girl Scouts. And um, we did, my mom and I put on day camp. We ended up writing an uh, entire adult program for outdoor skills building wow. for the Girl Scout Council here when I was 18. And then I went on to be one of the youngest people to take the training for trainers class that we held. It was like a statewide course through our Girl Scout Councils and did that um, as a, like a 19 year old. And that was all centered about teaching outdoor skills to adults so that they can teach the troops. So that's amazing. Yeah. And isn't it wonderful when you decide you're going to teach someone a skill, it changes the way you think about it. You have to really be articulate and careful about thinking about that skill and it, it sort of cements everything in your own brain, doesn't it? Yes, and what I find really interesting, in fact, on Sunday I, I – verbalize this to the class that I was teaching. I was doing kind of an introduction to nature journaling, focusing specifically on oak trees. And one of the things that I told the students as we were walking along this trail is that I can go out and uh, prep by going out on a trail system and thinking about what I wanted to teach or tell people. But when I'm out there with them, I always see things completely differently. And I might see a tree that I hadn't noticed before, like that's what happened on Sunday. And like, oh, look at that tree and how it how it is silhouetted against the sky right there and the shape of the canopy. And I hadn't even looked at that tree yeah. when I was prepping. You know, so I, I always see new different things and think of things in a different way um, as I'm explaining or teaching or exploring with other people. Mm -mm -mm. Yeah. And when and this love of nature 
how did that develop as you got older? So after after that part of your story, the the scout, the Girl Scouts, what happened next? Um, well, I met my husband um, when I was nineteen, and um, we we found that we both in, really enjoyed being outdoors. So we did quite a lot of day trips, different places, and hiking. And in fact, for our honeymoon, we car camped from California to Yellowstone National Park and the Grand Tetons. Wow. So we got, um, and that was for two weeks. So he had never been outside of California and it was really exciting to share those places with him. We thought we were hikers. That was 35 years ago. We thought we were hikers because we were like, oh, we can go out and do these trails and explore things. Over the last maybe five years, especially, and over the last 10 years, we've discovered a whole new way to be outdoors mm. in taking the time to explore every little thing we see rather than explore the destination that mm. we're going to and enjoying the journey. And we both took the California Naturalist um, college course and that even developed more skills at observation and wonder and Oh, we keep expanding our library of ordering new books or different books about the outdoors and nature. Um, so we both read a lot about nature, especially our local environments. Um, and that was the course that got me started on nature journaling because it was a, a requirement for our course that we do a page ah. a week. And I just was like, oh my God, totally mind blown. I can write, I can do poetry, I can do streaming thoughts, I can do words, I can do photography. Oh my God, I can't draw. <laughs> and that's when I got Jack's book and taught myself how to draw because I really wanted to. And we could do any of those things in the journal. It didn't have to be drawing. Um, and we actually did some sit spot sessions um, during that class. And I just found that I really, really wanted to learn how to do that. So, And how did that feel in the beginning? Do you have trepidation when you start, first started on your drawing journey? Absolutely. My mom um, liked to sketch nature when I was um, little, and she would often do charcoal sketches um, or really soft, um, dark pencil sketches. And she had her sketchbook. She had um, a kind of a journal notebook that she would do some color in. Oh, I just, I so aspired to want to do that. Sometimes she even painted acrylic paintings from mm -hmm. some of those. And that was a few of them. Um, just a few. I still have one of those. Um, but I so wanted to do that because I was like, wow, this is so neat to be able to, to do this. I never felt like I could. Um, it just, I just was so frustrated and so intimidated by myself and by the mediums. And in seventh grade, when I was um, 13, I took an art class and that was kind of more as an elective class so that it wasn't all academia. And I remember quite a few things that that teacher taught us, like the color wheel mm -hmm. and, um, and just learning some real basics. And I still felt like oh, I can't draw. I can't draw horses like Jennifer. I can't do this. <laughs> um, my best friend could draw horses really, really well. Um, she still can. Um, but um, I just I remember wanting so bad to to draw and sketch. And it was now that I look back on it, it was nature that I wanted to do. Mm -hmm. I ended up doing photography instead. And till until my eyes started to change and I realized I wasn't focusing the camera properly and all my pictures of wildflowers were coming out fuzzy <laughs> Been doing this for digital photography. Um, so, so I've always, I've always wanted to yeah. then to do art and drawing. And then I worked in a artistic rubber stamp store for about six years as an assistant manager. And we had both a wholesale and a retail division. And I worked in the retail store. That was all about art. My favorite rubber stamps, were nature and my favorite rubber stamps of nature were ones where I could put different images together to create a oh, scene yes and then I could I didn't have to draw it because we were stamping the images then I could use any kind of mediums and any color any kind of paper um, I could layer papers I could layer mediums I dug that I loved it and we were encouraged to explore 
all different kinds of mediums because we were selling that to our customers. So we taught lots of classes. I loved teaching watercolor and watercolor pencils and uh, Prismacolor pencils. We explored all kinds of different things. And that was really, really fun. And there's two of us still around here who worked at that store. That was back in the um, the 1990s, the late 1990s. We we both still miss that job so mm-hmm. much. The, the entire business ended up closing, um, and it was really really sad. Um, so that that was where I really learned about doing kind of basically I was nature journaling yeah and that's a really great example of how because us so many adults and a lot of even a lot of older kids come to uh, nature journaling with so much you know that the feeling like I can't do this or fear Mm -hmm. even um and our job as nature journal teachers I feel for for a lot of people is to help them step over that fear and to help them start to understand this is this is about having fun and that sometimes yeah. uh, we need to bring in different techniques that the bar is lower like you say stamping your your nature journaling because you're engaged with what you're you know you're engaged with nature you're building up a page and that's a one that obviously unlocks something for you that this is actually I'm being creative here and I'm connecting with Mm -hmm. nature and I think that as nature journal teachers our job is to find these little things and sometimes even it can be um, stamping with an actual leaf outdoors Mm -hmm. and I love your story because it shows that there are lots of different ways to engage creatively but engage creatively with nature. Yes, absolutely. So there was there were um, stamp artists who created um, just nature stuff. Mm. There's there's one man, um, Fred, who is in Oregon, and he created this whole line of stamps of rubber stamps based on printing like the skeleton of a fish. Oh, so you could what? get all these different <laughs> fish and leaves um, that were just like the uh, the the actual print of that thing, mm. and he created that into a stamp. So what we would do is teach our students how to do like a watercolor wash, and then stamp that leaf imprint yes. over that watercolor wash, and you could get all these fall colors and stuff. And it was just a blast. I and love that. Yeah. So so all kinds of different techniques and. I still have some of those, um, some of these stamps, um, haven't used them in a very, very long time. I can't get rid of them because they, they, They like with the ones from the scene, they're, they're part of me. Um, and a lot of them, like that scene that I showed you, I can still remember doing that one and what each of those stamps look like, you know, and how it felt to be coloring that and bringing out the depth and the different elements of that scene. And And that's what nature journaling um, does, connects us mm -hmm. to the memory of that creation. Yes. Yes. And that, that time, that moment, or, um, or even something that you want to go see, like I've never seen a toucan, but I can (laughs) pull one up like on bird pixel or something and draw it, sketch it over and over again, if I want. And imagine being with it, you know, so that I think that that's, I feel like the accessibility of nature is so incredibly important in whatever way or form people can find it. I love that you said that accessibility, because there are so many reasons why it might not be accessible to people and um, making that, making that barrier to entry lower is really important. Yes. I, I'd love for you to talk about talk more about the California naturalist and how that has um, uh, how that has extended into your life because I think just from your posts I can see that you're active in the parks and um, teaching people and I'd love to hear more about that. Um, well, the California Naturalist Program, it's um, based by the um, California Academy of Sciences, developed this class, and it's actually a college um, credit class. And it's taught by whatever agency decides to teach it. Um, and I'm not sure what their accreditation and stuff is. Um, I took my course from Sonoma Ecology Center, and that particular agency focused our class about the Sonoma Valley, which um, is a pretty large valley here in our county and encompasses a lot of different um, 
geology, Mm -hmm. geography, landscapes, um, environments, um, and watersheds. And so that, that, that agency focused out around that. There's another agency west of us that is involved with the California state parks all along the Pacific ocean. Um, and that one's called stewards of the coast and redwoods. So when they teach the class, it's all about the redwood groves and the tide pools and all of the interaction with the ocean environment. The one that I'd really love to take, it was be like my dream one Mm -hmm. is the course that's up in the Tahoe national forest up in the Sierras. And that one is at Sage Hen Creek Field Station. And Sage Hen Creek is a trail system that my husband and I especially like. And we've been observing it for about 20 years, Um, about once or twice a year. We go up and spend a week or two up there. And Sage Hen Creek is a go-to trail for us because it's, it's fun. It's not especially technical. Our dogs love it. And it's really fun to see how the beavers have changed the environment year oh, after year after wow. year. Um, and there's a field station up there that teaches this course up there. And I just would love to be up there um, to do that course. So it all depends upon where the course is being taught, what your actual curriculum looks like. But the base curriculum is pretty much the same. Um, and the same um, small textbook is used for all of the classes. So they have some specific things that are involved. And I felt like it was kind of more of a... Well, it was kind of more for me, like a proving ground Mm -hmm. that I have a certificate Mm -hmm. so I can have a title. It didn't, um, I learned a lot, but a lot of the stuff was kind of review for me as well. And that's not to boast, but because I grew up here and I'm really familiar with all of our um, landscapes here. Um, And, but it, it gave me nature journaling. It Mm -hmm. gave me iNaturalist. I didn't know anything about iNaturalist before this class. That was another thing that we were required to download iNaturalist and use it at least minimally. Oh my God. Okay. So I have like (laughs) almost 14,000 observations on iNaturalist, quality ones. And most of them have between um, two and 10 photos per subject. And I just, I just dig it. It's so much fun to be part of a, an international community that's providing information to science, especially now. Could you go back and for someone listening who doesn't know what the app does or how it works, could you explain that? Sure. iNaturalist is a, an app that you can use on a, a phone or on a, a mobile device or on a computer. And it's a free app that allows citizen science to be downloaded to it from anywhere in the world. And it's anything, anything in nature. It's not geology but it's any plants and animals. And it means anything, absolutely anything goes. So it can be a cultivated object or a wild object um, or non-cultivated. So you can do it in your own backyard. You can do it with your landscaped garden, but you can also do it anywhere in nature. So sometimes what happens is an agency or a park or um, a college or the academy, the uh, um, California Academy might have what's called a bio blitz where say they do a particular time set, like say Friday, Saturday, and Sunday this week, um, those three days we're capturing anything that's in tide pools along the California coast, wow. because they want to get that data point of what is existing in that environment right now. They can use that to compare to previous data that might've been gathered the same month in years past and what data is gathered next year on the same month in the same dates. It's, it's, I find it really fascinating because I'm, I'm not only able to participate in this gathering of information and data, but I also have learned so much from this app because I look at something differently. Mm -hmm. I've learned that it's not just an oak tree, but it's a valley oak. And on valley oaks, there's galls on the leaves. And you can, you start looking deeper into the details of this thing you're, this, this thing that you're looking at, this organism, this oak, and realize that it's not just an oak. 
it's not just a valley oak, but it's a entire habitat mm. and ecosystem. And there's all these things that are interacting with this particular tree. And you can learn so much about it by putting something on the app and having Beth Ann say, yes, I agree, this is a valley oak. And that confirms your identification. And you know that that's a valley oak because other naturalists have ident identified it. And then if I didn't know what something was and I just put unknown or I know that this is a dicot or I know that this is a mammal, then other people who know more about that subject come along and positively identify it. And I look at it even more intently like, okay, now I know it's a such and such. Yes. So that belongs in this family of plants or, or these kinds of mammals or, oh my gosh, that doesn't normally occur here. That is so cool that I saw this rare endemic flower. Um, you can look at maps of where things are. It's so important, I think, for um, research about our climate change. And that's also what I feel about nature journaling, because we're capturing moments, we're capturing details that we're seeing where we are. And those things could be important data points from the past and for our future of knowing what has changed and how it's changing and how we need to protect, adapt, um, preserve both the memory of those things as well as their future. I love that. I think you're absolutely right. I think that nature journaling has this way of capturing important information about what we have and what is going to change and what has changed. Uh, but iNaturalist itself, what a wonderful collaboration. It's an amazing way to bring together knowledge, bring together people and enthusiasm. And mm -hmm. yeah, what a beauty. Yeah. Um, it's taught it's taught me a lot about species that I didn't know I was interested in. So like I, um, I reached out to a, another local naturalist through iNaturalist app and said, hey, hi, my name is Sarah and I live in Santa Rosa and so do you. And do you want to get together sometime and do a hike? And she's really into mushrooms and she knows mushrooms. So she was like, oh, yeah, let's go to such and such place and let's let's look for mushrooms. And I was like, mushrooms. OK, well, I don't even eat <laughs> mushrooms. I don't like mushrooms. They are interesting to look at. I knew nothing about them except that's an orange mushroom and that's a brown mushroom. She taught me so much yes. just by listening to her talk about that's an Amanita or that's a Bolete and that's his why and this is what this occurs on. And oh my gosh, it's not just a valley oak that has gall wasps on it, but it also has a certain kind of um, shelf fungi that grow on it that's a mushroom species. You know, it's just like it yeah. just opened up even more. And I've learned so much about species that I had no idea I was interested in. That's um, cool. The other thing that I think that's, that's another point I wanted to make about nature journaling is that it's such a great way for people to learn about nature and our spaces and places, because um, it, it helps us to more deeply observe something. And so one of the things I have found that I really like about teaching introduction of nature journaling, even to people like Kate Rudder, who came on Sunday, is to start out by tracing a leaf. Yes. And that gets people past the, I can't draw, um, the fear of the blank page, you know, starting with just write down what date it is. And all yes. of a sudden, it's not a blank page anymore. And then put that leaf on your paper and trace around it. And you'll start to feel your body will start to feel the shapes in that leaf. And, and then I also used Beth Ann's class, gesture drawings, mm -hmm. um, gesture sketching, blind contour, those kinds of things to say, you know, that's going to continue getting your, your mind and your fingers used to the shapes you're looking at in this leaf. It may not be pretty, but it, you start to feel those shapes. And then when you trace it, you're looking even more intently at that thing. You're suddenly seeing shadows and lines and maybe the little brown scurfy stuff on the back of the leaf. And, and you just suddenly open up your mind even more and more into what you're looking at, even though it's just a leaf. And I've found that when I taught this, when I taught this the first time was at 
a weekend um, event for California naturalists. And so all these people had taken this course and have had to do a nature journal for at least that course, even if they didn't like it um, or didn't continue doing it. But when I taught the leaf tracing thing, oh my gosh, they just went gangbusters over yeah. it. And I'm like, wow, this, this makes so much sense. And, and it was an alder tree that we, we just happened to pick up leaves for. I'm like, just pick up any random leaf and trace it. And then, you know, if you have any color with you, put down some of the color that you see, even if you don't do it on the leaf tracing, and then write down what you're observing. And they just loved it so much. We could have spent all day just standing under that alder tree, but it made us also look up yes. at the alder tree and start discovering other things that it was growing with or that were growing on it or something about a leaf structure that we're like, Oh my God, look at how that leaf is shaped. I wonder why, you know, and just, you know, we just go off on that and it's, it's just fun. Yeah. And I I love that. I love that you teach that because sometimes in my classes, someone will have the urge or the inclination to trace and they say like, they'll be tentatively look up and say, is that okay? And I say, is yes. Okay? I always say like, yes, yeah. there's no cheating. There's no, you know, there's no right or wrong way. Right now you're right. connecting with that leaf. And if, you're in, if your impulse is to trace it, perfect. There's no, mm-hmm. you don't get extra marks for drawing it with, you know, <laughs> there's no, there's there are no rules yeah. <laughs> about doing this. Yeah. Yeah. And maybe, maybe you do a, um, what to you doesn't even look like the leaf in like a blind contour sketch, yeah. but you can also add a photograph of that leaf yeah. if you want to. And, you know, you don't have to get the colors just perfect, or maybe you jot the, some of the colors down in the margin of the paper um, off of your watercolor palette, just to remind you of what colors those yes. were. You don't have to get the color and the shading and the shadows and the lines, just exactly how you're seeing it in front of you. Um, but it's to remind you of that moment and what you learned about that thing. And, and maybe, maybe you'd like to do this to help other people learn about that thing too. So, yeah, there's something beautiful about bouncing that curiosity off each other in a class, isn't there? Then people say, Mm -hmm. look at that. Oh, and that little brown bit. I wonder what that, what's happening there. And the energy just grows because you're talking about it together. Yes. Yes. Yeah. And um, I, I'm just all about sharing my passion for nature. So mm-hmm. um, some of my friends tease me that, oh my God, I get to go for a hike with Sarah because I always see so much more. And she tells me about all these things <laughs> and, um, and it's almost embarrassing. Um, but, <laughs> and I don't mind it because I'm enjoying those moments too. And maybe I'm learning more about that thing because I said, oh, look at that, you know, or, or, yeah. you know, maybe I suddenly started really noticing the tracks in the dust even more today because I pointed them out to somebody else. And yeah, absolutely. If if someone asked you what is what is it to be a naturalist, what would you tell them? Um, well, the first thing that comes to mind is to be someone who's interested in nature. I you don't there's no there's no clear definition. There's no certification. Yeah. Yeah. There's um, to be a naturalist, either with a capital N or a little N, <laughs> really is someone who just has a curiosity and I think respect, um, maybe stewardship yeah. of nature in whatever form that takes. And I see even stewardship as even if you're donating money towards a land trust or something, that's still stewarding that land and nature. Even if you can't actively steward something like doing trail building or something, you're still stewarding nature that way. So, um, so I think there's, I think being a naturalist can take any form. It can be just enjoying going out and hiking with other people and just being outdoors, but it yes. can also be the study and research of, and the scientific part of it. You know, like those are the two kind of almost extremes, you know, I love this yeah. word. I think it's really fun. And I think that it's, I, I often tell, um, children when when we're closely observing we're being curious we're noticing things I say this is what naturalists do and because you're doing that now you're a naturalist and that always mm-hmm. brings a big beaming smile like yeah I'm actually doing it right now mm-hmm. yeah and I think I think sometimes people get caught up in in um thinking of naturalists as being something that 
is more politically charged, like being a tree hugger or <laughs> you know somebody who's laying down across the roadway to stop the logging trucks or whatever it is. Mm-hmm. And it's like, and it's not, it's not that kind of activism, mm-hmm. but I think that that can be an element in it. Mm-hmm. But being a naturalist doesn't mean that I'm um, uh, doing odd things. Or, you know, and <laughs> Extremist. It's, it's not, yeah, it's not politically charged. It's yeah. not religious, yeah. um, but it can be. I mean, all those things, they can be inclusive with all these different things. Mm-hmm. Um, I joke that I go to the church of horse and I, um, and I participate in the cathedral of nature <laughs> because I don't yes. really, I don't really engage with a specific um, formal religion, but my religion is definitely nature, yeah. mother nature. Yes. Yeah. Let's talk about horses because I'm a okay. horsey person too. And I, and I see uh, just from things you post online that horses are a really big part of your life. Tell me about how you came to love horses. Maybe everybody loves horses, but uh, I it's a special would, thing for you. <laughs> yeah. I, I definitely have it in my genes. Yeah. I think um, my, my grandfather, um, my paternal grandfather had horses as his drayage business in um, Toronto. Wow. And, um, and I never knew him, but horses were obviously very, very near and dear to his heart, because if he didn't have those horses, he wouldn't have a business. Um, and because of horses, he was um, drafted into World War One oh. on the front lines and was charged with taking care of the horses on the front lines. And seeing how they were used and abused and used up really broke his heart. And Today, we would call it PTSD. Mm. He could never be around horses again. He really couldn't ever hold a job again. Um, But I feel like there was definitely something very strong there in his uh, connection with horses, even though I never knew him. Mm. Um, And then my grandmother, on on my maternal grandmother, grew up on horseback um, in Northern California. And... um, it's kind of like the, that love of horses skipped a generation in my mom and I just got it full force. (laughs) Um, It's kind of interesting that my grandmother grew up on horseback. She rode thousands of miles, um, just constantly kind of patrolling the big, huge, massive ranches that her father managed. And she would actually patrol for poachers and she'd go out looking for cattle and rounding them up and stuff. And she was even known in the area for taking problem horses and just taking them on, like adopting them and riding them. Um, And it's kind of interesting that the parallel in my life is that I ended up with the current horse that I have right now, my Mustang, we ended up being patrol for our state and regional parks for almost 20 years. Oh, wow. And I, it was interesting that for quite a few years into that, I didn't even make the connection that my grandma patrolled and I patrolled. Amazing. Um, and, um, so I grew up wanting horses. I could, I just, I swear I was born wanting and loving horses. (laughs) I didn't get to, I, I collected Briar model horses. My Barbies had massive horse ranches. My dad built (laughs) little folding barns for us to have um, folding so they could tuck away in in an area and not take up a lot of space. My sister and I um, saved our piddly allowance towards buying the Briar models, and we always knew which one we were going to get next. And um, I think between us, when we became adults, I think between us, we had about 50 head of Briar model horses. <laughs> we made paper doll horses. Um, I even came up with a plan for my parents about how we could buy the house next door. We lived in a completely residential district. We could buy the horse, the house next door. My parents could level the house and that could be my paddock. paddock. <laughs> and then I could put in a double door, like a Dutch door on my bedroom. And the horse could actually come and put their head over the door into my bedroom. And for a stall, we had this huge garage, a huge two car garage. My dad was very, very specific about the cars had to go in the garage every night. So we never had anything that could block putting the cars in at night. But I came up with a plan how we could make sure that I could have a horse stall and he could still put one car in every night if I used (laughs) half of the garage. And my, unfortunately, my dad thought it was really cool, but that didn't come to be. (laughs) I didn't get to have my first horse, my own horse until I was 21. Mm -hmm. Um, I was married. um, We had just been married for about a year 
Um, so I was out on my own, my own money, my own life. And this horse, well, first, my first horse was actually one that my friend, my college friend gave me. So she sold him to me for a dollar. Oh. So we could officially transfer ownership with the understanding that if any time for any reason at all, she would come pick him up and take him up back up to the ranch where he had lived. And, you know, he would have a life even if I couldn't keep him. He ended up, um, because of his past and because he was such, um, I joke that God made all these horses and they had all these leftover pieces. And that was the <laughs> horse that I got. I mean, he had every default in the book. He was a love, but he couldn't do what I wanted to do. And mm -hmm. it was obvious that he wasn't going to be comfortable continuing to be active. Mm -hmm. So he went back up to the ranch and I was, oh, what was me? I now I suddenly don't have a horse. And the trainer at that barn said, you know, there's this horse out in the back in the pens. His owner had to give him up because he just stopped paying his board. And I told the trainer told him either you sign over the horse to me or you sell him and I get the money because you owe so much to me. So he ended up with this horse and um, he's like, so, you know, he's, he's back there. Check him out. You can lease him for as long as you want, give him a try, see if you like him. And if you like him, we, we can talk. It took me about three weeks before I was like, Jan, so can I buy this horse? <laughs> and this, this previous owner owed him a lot of money for mm -hmm. past board and, and everything, all the care for this horse, thousands of dollars. This trainer sold him to me for $850. Wow. I made payments on this horse, like buying a car. Nobody <laughs> does that. But he knew that I would stay with them yes. and, um, and stay there for training. And that horse was, to me at the time, a dream come true. He took, I dreamt that as a kid, it was all about showing a horse at the fairgrounds was like, to me, the epitome of having a show horse, because that was my, my frame of reference. And, um, so that horse, I ended up going a year later to a show at the fairgrounds. So I was riding my own horse in a horse show at the fairgrounds. Amazing. And that was just so cool. That was a five day show. It was huge. Um, and we ended up doing that show for, I think, three years in a row. We showed in between. Um, we did Hunter Over Fences. And I thought he was like the dream come true. He mm -hmm. was really beautiful. He was really athletic. He, he loved showing. So then, um, fast forward, things fell apart at that barn and I ended up moving him to another barn where another couple of friends had gone. And some people there invited me to go out trail riding. And I'm like, you don't understand. My horse can do anything within a fenced area, but trail riding <laughs> is not his idea of fun. <laughs> well, one of those friends finally begged me to come out to a park and she would trailer us. And if I needed to get off and walk, she'd get off and walk with us. Her horse was really awesome. My horse and he were really good friends. So my horse just stuck his nose in that other horse's tail and away down the trail we went. I was so nervous and I was hooked. And I swear something had flipped in that, in my horse that mm -hmm. all of a sudden he's now a trail horse. Yes. We ended up, five of us ended up moving from that barn to another barn adjacent to this huge park, 5,000 acre park. So we could ride across the street, right into that park without having a trailer. Wow. We loved it. We rode out in the park like every day. <laughs> and that was really a life changer for me. Yeah. Um, when that barn closed, I had to find another place to take my horse and I didn't have a trailer. I didn't have any way of getting to the parks. And I made a friend with somebody who boarded there who had a truck and trailer. And she's like, sure, your horse will nice. get in the trailer. Yeah, come with me. <laughs> so at 20, my horse was 20 and we were going out and conditioning for endurance rides with her youngster horse. And because my horse was going with him on those conditioning rides, just to go out on trails, we ended up just starting to do endurance when yes. he was 20. and. Um, when I lost him, he died suddenly just shy of 25 years old. I was looking for another horse that would be able to succeed him in doing endurance and doing these trail riding. And that's the Mustang that I have now. Um, and we ended up doing endurance. And then when we had an accident in one of the parks and both of us were injured, um, the ranger who came to our rescue said, oh, the way she handled her emergency and her horse's emergency, I need you on volunteer patrol. And I'm like, really? What's that? And that started Amazing. our 20 years of doing patrol in, as volunteers in the regional and state parks here. So we've um, 
we have 10 state parks here in the county. Um, and right now, I think we have 62 regional parks, and almost all of them allow horses. So he and I have been in all these different parks and have done volunteer work and volunteer patrol and been ambassadors to the whole community. He's very personable. He's really cute. Um, little kids love his name because his name is Oreo. So nice. Than Oreo. <laughs> he's got graffiti on his neck because he's a um, he's a Mustang from the American West, and they put a freeze brand on their neck oh. to identify them. And so he's got this white brand on his neck, and I joke that it's his graffiti. <laughs> and um, and it's fun to be able to educate people about Mustangs yeah. too a little bit. And people are amazed that well, he's not wild. Well, he never was wild, but they don't, they, you can tame them, but they do think totally different. He's taught me so much about a different perception of the world um, because of the things he notices. And our relationship obviously is very, very close. Um, he, he's definitely my, my heart horse. Yes. And um, where I have him now, um, we've been, he's been living there for 14 years and the trainer and owner of that barns has, has told me several times over the last few years, this is not your last horse. You are too young not to have a successor horse. And then the neat thing is that no matter what, he can stay living there for the rest of his life, whether I can ride him or not. And there's so many different neat things about that ranch. It's a 40 acre ranch that has a stream that runs a seasonal stream along one whole side of the ranch. So I get to see all the wildlife and habitat of that stream. And then there's all these different wild animals that come onto the ranch and all the horses are comfortable with them because they're all used to them every day and every night. Um, so it's really, really neat to study nature even there. Yes. And it was my, it was my heaven during the pandemic. All of our parks got locked down for a few months. Um, and then, and I was able to go out there and be out there every day. So I still had my nature and the views are beautiful from there. Yes. Um, so that was, that was heaven. Um, and um, so that's where he still lives. And it's really fun to have been there for, for long enough yes. that like I know some of the raptors that, that um, live adjacent to the property and I see their seasons and when they're bringing up their young and who's kind of being territorial with who. And um, right now the foxes are really, really active. So there's fox poop everywhere around <laughs> at the ranch. And we can see from day to day where they have been, even in the paddocks with the horses um, because they're leaving their calling cards. Um, so it's just, yeah, it's just really fun to, to study nature out there too and realize this, this is a, a business property, but there's so much nature still to see and to point out to people. It's a, it blows my mind that people can be outdoors and not notice those birds right there in the yes. trees that are yes. having a fuss about something. Um, when I'm, when I'm teaching outdoors and even when I'm out there talking to a friend or something, I get, I have to tell people that if I look around, it's not because I'm distracted by our conversation. It's because, oh my God, look at that bird flying by. You know, and If you happen to watch where I'm looking, you're going to see something because I can't not be aware of what's going on around me. Yeah. And um, maybe that's the, that's the key thing about a naturalist that we were talking about before or mm -hmm. nature journaler. We notice things that may, maybe mm -hmm. people let pass by. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Another thing that I do, which is, is really fun is, because I have, I've always been active with our parks around here. Um, mm -hmm. This one park that opened in 1975, I planted conifer trees on the dam of the lake. And so I was there on opening day. And that, that's actually where I did my Girl Scout project. I still am out there frequently. I know the rangers that work there. Um, I know some of the habitat so intimately. Um, and so I've been involved with a lot of these parks for a long, long time. I started getting involved in the park planning processes too, as a citizen, as a mm -hmm. volunteer. And because of that, it led me to teaching a land management seminar for our university. And 
they do a whole semester course on land management, but most of it takes place on the university's private preserve and on another private preserve. So they don't have the aspect of a public access property. So I've been able to incorporate my knowledge of the parks and planning and land management from a public land perspective to teach a seminar, a day seminar. And then I also arrange for four work days for them to go out on the lands with an agency that, that trail builds or does maintenance. And they actually get to put their hands on learning from people with a lot of experience how to build a trail or how to maintain a trail and why it's important to get the water trained off of this trail and how you do it so that it can be sustainable and for not only for recreation but also for protection of the and preservation of the land and that has been so incredibly valuable it's been so much fun to teach and um i think this this is going into the sixth year that i've taught that um and seeing the excitement of the college students because they're there taking that class because they want to is really energizing and fun and having the support the professor that I work with is fantastic too and I get free access to the private preserve because I'm teaching so that's pretty cool too amazing and also to be able to have all this knowledge that you've gathered just from being there and and knowing that mm-hmm. place intimately and be able to share that because yeah. obviously sharing and teaching is part of your yeah part of your life something important to you you got that <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yep so let's talk about hiking because you've mentioned it a couple of times and and going mm-hmm. through the parks and i'm wondering about hiking with your husband or others who maybe aren't nature journalists and how you manage that uh, you know, there, there's that there's that idea that we can go far or we can go deep, and I wonder how you manage that when you're walking with others who aren't nature journalists. I, if I if I want to nature journal, I truly choose who I'm <laughs> out with and where we're going, because. Like today, when I wanted to go out and hike with a friend who would be fine just sitting down and nature journaling, and Mm -hmm. she wants to learn more about it too, I really wanted to be just minimalistic today and just be out there enjoying nature for nature's sake and for myself. So I didn't take anything. I just told myself, okay, you can take my iPhone. I can take pictures if I want. I can even journal some of that later if I want. So I will often take pictures. I have to make a deal with my husband when we're out if I want to nature journal, because at first he was like, Oh my God, we're going to be sitting here for hours. I'm like, look, I can do quick sketches and I can just, just give me 10 minutes. I promise you can even set a timer. Just give me 10 minutes. And I really proved it to him when we went on vacation in July up to the Sierras and the Sierra mountains is I had to show him that I can just sit down for 10 minutes and do something And he can keep himself occupied because he gets so interested in looking at stuff. He has a little hand lens and he's like, Oh my God, look at the little stuff on that rock. And you know, so that's fun too. And, and I, of course, because we've, we've known each other for so long, I can feel when he starts to go, okay, I'm getting bored. Come on, can we go? (laughs) And he's pretty good about telling me, okay, I'm done here. Um, We need to move on. And so we, we've had to kind of work through that a little bit. And he's learned that, that it doesn't have to be hours that I'm sitting there with my journal. It can be a few minutes. It can be 10 minutes. It can be 30 minutes. Maybe it's during our lunch break where we're sitting and eating lunch. I'm going to grab out my journal and and do something. Um, And um, I've had to learn the skills though of it's okay if you don't finish something right here, right now, maybe get some of the colors um, and do some of the general sketching or general impressions um, words or feelings, um, questions and get those jotted down. So I don't try to remember them later, but I can always add color later if I want to. Yes. Um, the field sketching and field color has been challenging because I was very intimidated by that. Um, and watching Roseanne Hansen and some of her stuff has really helped creating my own little trail palette has really helped Mm -hmm. too so that I'm not taking this big thing of paints or sometimes because I'm so so familiar with the Prismacolor colored pencils from the 
um, art store um, from when I taught at the rubber stamp art store. I know the names of the colors and I know the colors intimately. So I can even write down color names yes, next to something amazing. and say, okay, so that's going to be marine green plus lime peel and a little bit of, you know, real orange or whatever. So I can write down those colors because I have them in my mind. Um, that helps too. Um, and then just all of the, the, practice time of making messy pages and playing with watercolor, playing with the colors and figuring out what you can mix that doesn't make mud. But sometimes the gunk in the palette is the truly the color you want. Yes, you know? I, I love um, that. I love it when you just smear in what, what was there from yesterday's painting and it's actually the perfect color. And darn if you can repeat it. Yes. That's the difficult <laughs> thing. And I'm such a, I want to go back to that same color again. Yeah. That it's like, okay, how did I make that? So I've actually <laughs> made myself little color charts of if I mix this and this and it's going to get this. And if I add a little bit more of that, then it's going to get that. I've done that a little bit. Um, but I... I had to develop my own trail palette and it's this, this little color set Great. and it's the colors that, um, that I tend to, they're my go-to colors mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and the colors of my landscapes. If I went someplace else, definitely they'd be different colors. Um, and some of these colors, once I made this set of, um, five, 10, 15 colors, I've have found that some of the colors I hardly ever use mm -hmm. and some of them I use a lot. Mm -hmm. um, um, so this really helps because it's small enough that I can take it with me almost anywhere. And doing that made a huge difference and learn understanding and learning that if I spend a little bit more money on quality watercolor, I'm going to be so much happier with the outcome yes. because they mix better. They look better once they're dry. Um, I started with this little like, $5 set of watercolors that I'd had forever that were part of my rubber stamp stuff too. And that was fun. And it got me over the idea of using watercolor, but then I found, Oh, I just want some richer colors that really work. So getting quality, some quality watercolors really, really made a difference. That's great um, advice. And then I use, I did, I made myself a little card that I slip in the back of my nature journal that actually has those colors on a piece of paper yes. and labeled with the color names. And then some of the colors I mixed with it and how I got to those colors that I thought I might use. And Great. then I also did it for John Muir Laws's palette so that I know exactly what those colors look like, not printed on a sticker, but yes. actually painted on a on piece your of paper. cardstock. Yeah. Actually, I hate this paper, but <laughs> <laughs> I didn't like it at all. It absorbed the, the paint too much, but at least it gives me the idea of what the color would yeah. look like. And for your landscape, when you, the, what, the colors that you find, you know, diminishing that you're using regularly, what are the actual colors that you find yourself oh, reaching to? Um, I have to put my glasses on. <laughs> um, there's, I think some of it is just colors that I'm personally attracted to, mm -hmm. but mm -hmm colors that I definitely use a lot in my landscapes here are um quidacridome gold mm -hmm. appetite green, genuine serpentine and undersea those are the greens that I use a lot mm -hmm. um I find that the undersea green tends to be a a color of our oaks which mm -hmm. I do a lot um and then ultramarine blue tends to be kind of my go-to sky yeah. color for around here. Um, and I think it was actually from one of your classes, I realized how different the skies in different parts of the world are yes. totally different blue. Um, so um, then I, I tend towards raw umber a lot for things. I love using bloodstone brown, the brown bloodstone. I think it's bloodstone genuine. Mm -hmm. um, and um yeah, those are kind of the colors of our landscape. Yeah. And then burnt sienna. Burnt sienna and burnt umber are like the color of our landscape right now because it's so dry. Yes. And it's kind of, it's beyond being golden. Now it's turned like dry brown. Mm -hmm. And um and it's it's interesting to discover what colors are the seasons of the, your local yes. place. Yes, I think mm -hmm. that's a powerful experience to see the colors changing and to take notice of them. Mm-hmm. I'm wondering, because you do a lot of um, uh, learning and classes online and lots of pencil miles from 
um, classes and teachers online. I'm wondering about how that translates to you uh, to you feeling comfortable out in the field because I know you've done journal pages sketching herons from a from a kayak and it, you know sketching here and there quickly. I'm wondering if you feel like the 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 body memory or the pencil miles that you do uh, in classes helps you to be more spontaneous out in the field. Definitely, um, because it's kind of it's like that body memory of mm. using the pen or the pencil um, and being okay with learning how it's going to respond on the paper and how you can use it in different ways and then just learning different techniques of of drawing something and especially if you only have 10 seconds yes um, or whether you have a couple of hours to get all the minute detail or something um, the learning how to kind of sculpt items like um, and different techniques of that from different teachers so I I love that I learned I started to learn how to draw birds from John Muir Laws from a couple of the tutorials online and and from his book from his first book the introduction to nature journaling and then that was pretty cool I learned that I could actually draw birds yes but then he changed how he's teaching how to draw birds yes. and I was like wow you see it it can it can morph yes. and so as we learn more techniques from teachers then they become ours and we can take what we learn and figure out what works for me and my style. And the more I do that online with teachers, because I can access teachers from all over the world, then I can, that can translate into what I'm doing out in the field. Um, to the quick sketch idea has been a mind blower for me. Cause like, <laughs> like the waterfowl, when I'm drifting out in a kayak, the waterfowl don't stay still, you know, they're moving, they're preening, they're reacting, or they're trying to climb into the kayak with me. Um, some of our Canadian geese do that and it's like, go, 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 no, go out back over there. Um, and, and like doing, even sketching the horses, it's so difficult because they're constantly in movement. Um, so learning different techniques like that. And I just love that that because unfortunately because of the pandemic we've gone so virtual but fortunately we've gone so virtual so that we can meet people from yes. all over the globe yes. who have different experiences with nature who have different experiences with getting images on paper and we can learn and adapt our own style from all of that and figure out what works for me, what I like and what I like doing. So I've practiced a lot of different styles because of being with different teachers online. Um, and I can see my style develop and developing. And there's definitely some people who I'm like, oh, I wish I could do it just like that person does. <laughs> I love that style. Um, so that teaches me too, because it's okay to copy. It's okay to, Absolutely. Um, oh, one of my, one of my naturalist friends this last weekend at the class that I did flipped through a few pages of her journal. And now I really want to get together with her and we can like really, really look into each other's <laughs> journals. She actually does sketches from Charles Mackesy's um, books, the, um, the boy, the mole, oh, the fox yes. and the horse. Oh my gosh. And she, I love this. she was practicing sketching, quick sketching using his sketches as an example. And I was like, wow, that's so powerful. And when you look at his sketches, you can even, even if you don't want to do animals or a little boy, looking at how he quick sketches trees and a landscape, is just, there's so much to learn from that. Yes. Um, I even, I don't think I have it in my room right here with me, but there's an author who I really like, um, who has a series of books that are just, they're they're almost it's all writing but it's narrative story but at the beginning of each chapter there's a teeny little drawing of um that are just quick sketches of a person or the theme of that chapter mm -hmm. and that has taught me a lot about how to draw profiles because they're just quick little sketches of somebody and this person who did these sketches 
has the has it down of what the priest looks like you know the, the size and shape of his nose or you know how he how he looks that he's kind of chinny and stuff that <laughs> that's consistent through the books and that taught me kind of how to look at quick sketching people um and and practicing that way by looking at other people's works it's okay because yes. then you're develop you're also discovering and developing your style and what you want to do um, I'm still struggling with some of them. I mean, we're constant learners and I certainly feel like I'm nowhere near perfect. I'm not where I want to be. And to do more pencil miles and do more classes helps to continue to make me feel more confident in, in doing some of this for my own self. Um, and, and I have fun with it. Um, I have to say it is, it is very confidence building to have somebody glance at your page, even if you don't want them to. And they're like, wow, yeah. wow, <laughs> you did that. You know, I'm like, oh yeah, <laughs> yes. Okay. So I guess it does look like what I'm yes. looking at. Um, I mean, that's amazing. I love that you express that about looking at someone's work and emulating that. And in that process, you don't make something exactly the same as them. You make something that's inspired by that, that's in your own style. And that's how you develop as an artist. And I think that that's mm -hmm. really valuable. Yeah. So we talked about things moving online and how that is, has its upsides and its downsides. One of the really strong upsides is accessibility. And we mentioned yes. accessibility. I'd love to talk to you about your own health struggles and how that affects your ability to go out and your ability to participate in nature and how you manage that and get, get through it? Well, I've been a pain sufferer for almost all my life. I tend to push past pain because if I, if I let it get to me or if I let it rule me, I would never do anything. Yeah. Um, and I'm more uncomfortable if I'm sedentary, definitely. Um, if I'm active, then I can kind of avoid thinking about that discomfort or that yes. pain. So, um, and I, I'm also definitely know that the more I move, the more I can continue to move. Yes. So that that's definitely a factor in it. Um, because of the way my back is formed and um, we've only just discovered this when I was 56, that I was probably born this way. Um, that I'm limited in the amount of travel I can do. I cannot be comfortable. Sometimes I can only be comfortable in a car for a few minutes. Mm. So definitely traveling long distances for conferences or, or even vacation, something that's recreational is pretty much out for me. So finding something like Wild Wonder and the International Journaling um, Week online is totally a game changer yes. because I don't have to think about my comfort level. I can be, I can sit in my office chair and adjust it to the way it's comfortable enough for me, or I can stand, or I can take it outside and sit at my own picnic table, whatever it is that I can be comfortable, or I could take a break. Yes. Um, I think if I felt like I had to travel to something like wild wonder, I would feel like I have to attend every class to get everything out of it. And yeah. I'd be so exhausted for one thing, because it's just mind blowing to be learning for eight hours or 10 hours a day, <laughs> whatever it is. But also the, the physical act of trying to be comfortable is very exhausting. Yes. And it can be overwhelming. And for me, no amount of any kind of drugs helps me at all. Um, and, and believe me, I've tried different things. Um, so nothing touches my pain. So I can't, it's not like I can say, oh, I'll just knock back a couple of ibuprofen and I'll be good for a couple hours. It doesn't yeah. work that way. I don't feel comfortable traveling on airplanes because of the discomfort. So I doubt that I'll ever get back to Switzerland again. Um, but because of the virtual aspect of online learning, I can attend at my own comfort level. Finances are definitely part of that accessibility as well. So, so for me to be able to take these classes and not have to pay for the travel and the overnight and the food um, is huge. And I see that, I've seen that definitely in the virtual classes that there's, there's more attendance, there's more 
significant attendance by a broader range of people yes. because it's available. Um, we saw this even locally, our land trust that is um, our, in our county, um, they had been holding in-person classes for years um, about their preserves or about they might have somebody come in and speak specifically about wildflowers in the county or about raptors or whatever. And my husband and I found ourselves signing up for them and then going, and, uh, well, we have to get dressed. We have yes. to, uh, we have to eat dinner before we go. And then we have to go and be in this room with other people. My husband doesn't like being in crowds. So yeah. even being in a room of 30 like-minded people can be very uncomfortable for him. Um, and I found it very uncomfortable too, because the chairs rarely fit me. So we found ourselves more often than not going, oh no, we don't feel like going out tonight. Yeah. When the pandemic happened and they shifted all of that to virtual online presentations, I was like signing up every week. Yeah. <laughs> I was going to all of them and donating every Amazing. single time and encouraging yeah. other people to donate every single time because it requires staff and technology and different and stuff. It's been so rewarding. And I've been able to share these online classes, presentations with more people who I meet because they're archived and I can encourage them support the land trust. You can go look at these things free on our, on our archived website, but think about it. If you really liked what you saw, donate to them because they're saving and preserving the nature that we enjoy. And they're providing programs to get people out on these lands. Um, many of which have turned into public access properties. So I've seen in those that there's more people participating in those because they're online than they ever did when we were in person. We've had people, they've had up to 500 people on some of those presentations wow. where there's no way we could even yes. fit more than 30 people in the classroom mm -hmm. at their facility, at their offices. We've had people from all over the United States join into these virtual sessions and that is so exciting and so much fun because you end up making connections with other people. And whether you're a people person or not, we are a part of nature. So yes. it's, you know, and it, the cool thing is this land trust did a class on nature journaling too. <laughs> um, and they engage a lot of different people to explain about our land, like one of the one of the people who I happen to know before he did this one, he did a presentation called the California Serengeti. And it's he takes you in his time machine back nice. to the Pleistocene and what our entire area of the San Francisco Bay Area would have looked like in the Pleistocene. Amazing. And the way he describes it and even the the drawings, the nature journal type of drawings that he uses in his presentation give you a picture of what our land would have looked like at the time of the mammoths and the California tiger lions and the the massive undulates that we had in our lands that were we would consider deer these days, but our deer are nowhere near the size of what they would be. Yes. And it's so neat because it gives you a different connection with our place and with our land and with nature. And you see the land differently, like, like to make the connection to come back to the California naturalist class and the Sonoma Valley, because of his explanation about what this area would have liked, like in the Pleistocene, that Sonoma Valley was likely um, partially created by the mammoths. And they actually had a trail that they used up through that valley, which now is a highway that we use oh, almost every day. Wow. And it probably follows the exact same path as those mammoths made through up through that valley. And and he's he's a renowned archaeologist. So he knows what he's talking about. Um, it's not just, you know, like his guesses. He's done a lot of research. He's retired now from being a state archaeologist. So he's able to actually give more time to these kind of presentations and writings and and delve more into the research of it too and share with more people. Um, and that connectivity with the land, it, it's so, so important on a local and a global level. Absolutely. Yeah. And you and this online format, it helps us connect with experts that yes. that we might not have ex access to as well and also share and make friendships as uh, through this time, through this sort of 
condensed online sharing time since COVID. I've made some friends that I'll have forever because yeah. at, people that I've never met face to face, but that you can right. you can build you can build connections like this, can't yes. you? Yes. And you have something in common. Um, one of the things that I've learned through struggling with some of my chronic um, health conditions, one of them is the pain, but I also am a persistent Lyme disease sufferer. And it's difficult because a lot of the friends that I used to have, I realized we both got tired of my story. Mm -hmm. So I got tired telling my story and they got tired asking me how much pain are you in today or hearing about it. So I've found that I'm choosing who I'm spending time with a little differently um, and realizing that it's real important to have people in my life who are supportive of me. They don't necessarily have to always hear my story about my pain or Lyme disease or whatever, but they're supportive of me as a person. And that's one of the things that I found really valuable in finding the friends through nature journaling, the yes. nature journal club, through some of the online things we already had a connection yes. and now we have an even stronger connection, something in common. And there, I find everybody being so supportive. Um, I've made some friends that I would have never met. I have a friend in Nepal yes. in Kathmandu <laughs> that I met through the nature journal club. And we often find ourselves chatting back and forth on Facebook or on messenger several times a week. Yes. We never met each other. Um, <laughs> we each have our own struggles and we share about some of that. And it's just, it's, it's become a friendship, not just about yes. sharing, doing art on paper. Um, yeah, it's, it's really, it's really fun. That's and it's, amazing. It's very rewarding. It's been so nice to chat to you. I feel connected to you because we both share love of nature, nature journaling, and also horses. Horses were a big part of my story. That when you were talking about the uh, that girl who couldn't stop dreaming about horses, that was me. It was mm. <laughs> so nice to hear that. I still have four of my Briar models, my favorite ones. <laughs> I still have my horse paper dolls yes! stored in my garage. Oh my goodness! <laughs> um, and and thousands and thousands and thousands of pictures of my current horse because I can't ever <laughs> stop. He's just so cute. Um, and I would love to learn more about you, about Beth Ann, um, but we'll have to make that another time. <laughs> yes, my goodness. It's been so, so nice to chat to you. Thank you for joining me on the podcast. Yes, thank you. I hope you enjoyed this conversation with Sarah. It struck me as significant that she's not only teaching and sharing her knowledge and passion for nature, but also continually learning from other artists and naturalists and from nature herself. I think this continual lifelong exchange of knowledge, passion and curiosity is a wonderful and inspiring thing. Thank you so much for listening. See you next week.